Hi, I'm Andrew Phillips with the Graymere Church of Christ, and I appreciate you joining us on Connections. Life brings with it a great deal of frustration, doesn't it? I can only imagine the kind of frustration that you would be dealing with if you were the Apostle Paul and you had been imprisoned. The very thing you're wanting to do is travel around and to tell people about Jesus, and that's the one thing you can't do. You're limited. Yet even though he's facing this serious kind of grief and sorrow, he chooses to be joyful. And if we've, as we've looked through the book of Philippians, we've seen these terms, this language of joy and rejoicing that shows up. And one temptation we may have when we read this passage is that when we get to chapter 2 and Paul starts talking about specific individuals, we might think, oh, okay, he's turning off the deep spiritual instruction. Now we're just getting into the practical everyday things that aren't really as important to us. But what Paul has to say here about specific individuals, individuals named Timothy and Epaphroditus, is actually a continuation of the picture he's painting of biblical servanthood. In fact, it's like what a teacher will do when they're wanting their students to sit down and be quiet, they'll often say things like, I like the way so-and-so is sitting quietly. They're finding an example, and by holding up that example, they're encouraging everyone around them to do the same thing. And so, as he describes Timothy and Epaphroditus in this passage we're going to read, he also tells the Philippians they should hold people like that in high esteem. In other words, these are the kinds of people that we honor. We want to be like them. Think for just a moment about the kind of honor we hold for people today. Who is it that receives a place of honor in our society? When I was growing up, NBA basketball player Charles Barkley made the news when he came out with a commercial that said, I'm not a role model. Just because I dunk a basketball doesn't mean I should raise your kids. Well, that caused quite a stir because people were upset he wasn't taking his place as a role model more seriously. But I think he was also pointing out something telling. We tend to make celebrity athletes and movie stars into role models. I wonder sometimes if we really carefully think about the values of the people we hold up to emulate. We emulate the people we honor. There is a reason that boys playing football will try to carry themselves like famous NFL players. There's a reason we buy things that we see famous people wear. We tend to emulate the people we honor. I can remember years ago hearing a minister describe a, a well-known preacher from Ireland who was inspiring to him. He used to listen to this preacher's sermons all the times until his wife finally told him he had to stop because he was picking up a little bit of his accent in his preaching. Again, that shouldn't surprise us. We tend to emulate the people we honor. And so Paul tells the Philippians that when Epaphroditus comes home, they should honor people like him. He sets out to describe why there are true Christian servants. And by understanding what Paul's pointing to here, we can understand some areas we can emulate. So here's what we read starting in verse 19 of Philippians chapter 2. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare, for they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately, as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself also will be coming shortly. But I thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier who is your messenger and minister to my need because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. What do we see in the lives of these real people that Paul's talking about here? First of all, we see sincere care. Timothy truly cares about Christians in Philippi and Paul contrasts that concern with the concern of others. We know the importance of sincere emotion. This genuine concern is sincere. Our more modern term for sincerity actually comes from a Latin term, without wax. There was an older practice for merchants to use wax to try to hide defects or cracks in pottery. And so the honest salespeople would advertise their materials as being without wax. 
sincere. We're not covering anything up here. We've all had conversations with people who have given us messages with a little bit of wax. They might have claimed that they cared about something, but we could tell that that concern wasn't really genuine, wasn't really sincere. There's a word we typically use to describe people who say they care about something when they really don't. That word is hypocrite. Jesus uses that terminology as well. Epaphroditus truly cared about Christians in Philippi. And like Paul, Epaphroditus longed to see the people in the church there. It seems that he was an emissary from Philippi who would have wanted to see the people he loved. And as was the case with Timothy, this love was genuine. He was distressed because they had heard he was sick. And the word distress used here isn't just a little bit concerned. It's the same kind of terminology you get when you read about Jesus in the garden being distressed. In other words, he's seriously focused on these people. He had been dispatched to Paul with the gifts and apparently had become ill. So maybe someone who had with him, who's with him had told the church at Philippi, maybe they received word. He genuinely cared about their condition. Does my care for people extend beneath the surface? Am I cultivating a heart that really cares for who people are? Am I praying to have that kind of heart? Am I looking for ways to develop that kind of heart? We see sincere care, but we also see selfless service here. Timothy cared more about Christ than himself. Now we see evidence of that in the way he chooses to go with Paul in the book of Acts. Since his father is not Jewish, he chooses to be circumcised so he can more effectively reach Jews that he's trying to teach about Christ. Epaphroditus cared more about serving than his own life. He was seriously ill, but putting his own concerns second to getting help to Paul. A few years ago, a psychologist named Lawrence Slater wrote a magazine article entitled The Trouble with Self-Esteem, and it raised some eyebrows. It raised eyebrows because she cited three different studies that all indicated that low self-esteem is not as big a problem in society today as high self-esteem. She stated people with high self-esteem pose a greater threat to those around them than people with low self-esteem. Now you can imagine why that would get a big reaction, but it's worth, it's worth thinking about. Now, we don't need to aspire to having low self-esteem since we're all human beings made by God. He gives us value. Our nature is being made in God's image gives us value, but we also don't need to think too highly of ourselves, as Paul would remind us in Romans 12, because it's God who guides us. Being selfless doesn't require to think less of ourselves, but just to think of ourselves less and to think of others more. When we focus on Christ, we'll think of ourselves in that proper perspective. But we also see some serious dedication here. Timothy was an apprentice to Paul. In the ancient world, it was typical for sons to be apprenticed to their father's business. We might think about Jesus working as a carpenter or mason with his father, Joseph. Paul was not married and didn't have any children, so it's as if Timothy is working with him the way a son would. And when Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, verse 2, he described him as a child in the faith. Timothy was not a, a slave to Paul, but rather both Timothy and Paul were slaves to Christ and to the gospel. Epaphroditus was a fellow soldier. And just like a fellow soldier often serves sacrificially, he served when it might have cost him his life. Now, Paul would use army and war imagery to describe how to fight and to stand up for our faith in the middle of challenges. How dedicated am I? If someone were describing my faith, would they say that I was a soldier? Could they use that kind of language? Who are the kind of people we're honoring? Who are the kind of people we're emulating? Are they people who have sincere faith, who serve selflessly, and who have serious dedication? If not, who do I need to honor? And how can I live the kind of life where I can share these traits so that I would be a person that falls into the category Paul uses here of people like that? Those are the people we should honor and emulate. What can I do today to start living like that? In the place I exercise in town, there is a large sign on one wall, and it says, no judgment. Now, part of that I really like. I mean, when I'm there exercising, I certainly don't want people watching and judging me 
And it's a pretty popular statement in our culture today, no judgment. I've even noticed that spell check allows you to spell judgment with the E or without the E. So there isn't even any judgment being made about the way you spell the word judgment. But a byproduct of that kind of philosophy is the idea that all judgment of any kind is bad or wrong. In a sense that it's almost wrong to make any judgment call ever. Now there are definitely times we need to refrain from judgment. Jesus describes this in the Sermon on the Mount. We are not the judge and jury on what other people do. It's always important to remember that. We live in a world where passing judgment has never been easier. I can see something and make a snap judgment. I can read something and make a, a passing judgment. When someone says something to us that might be embarrassing or out of step with the times, to say that we're going to respond to that with a quick post or a quick tweet judging what they say, it's easy to pass judgment. But as we think about the elements of our faith that help us deal with the world around us, the concept of judgment is an important one. And it, it might not be popular today. We might even be ashamed that we believe in a God that will judge us, but it's what we read in Scripture. And understanding it will help us handle some of the challenges we're living with today. See, judgment means some specific things. Judgment means that actions matter. We need to reflect on the role that we play in judgment. So Jesus would say in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 7, enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Or this in John chapter 3, 19 through 21. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and that men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. There's a strong connection between the choices we make and the price we pay for those choices. When we choose a life without God, he honors our choice. For instance, in Romans 1, Paul describes the way many who have suppressed the truth of God have chosen to exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for idol worship. And three different times over the next few verses, we hear the phrase, God gave them over. In other words, when they chose to exchange the truth of God for something else, God allowed them to reap the consequences of their actions. Judgment means that our actions matter. And judgment also means that sin matters. We often think we want a world without judgment. We can imagine a world without judgment as a largely positive thing. In our minds, we assume that a lack of judgment means everything is okay. But in reality, we don't want a world without judgment. Take a moment to imagine some of the most horrific crimes you can picture. In a world without judgment, those things don't matter. There's no consequence for them. In a world without judgment, nothing matters. And no one ever has to pay for their actions. Not too long ago, I had the experience of walking with my son and several others from his class through the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Even though I had read a lot about the Holocaust before I first visited there several years ago, I can remember the shock of being face to face with pictures of the atrocities that had taken place. You know, many of the other museums that are in Washington, D.C., the other Smithsonian museums, you can kind of duck in and out. You might run to go see a specific exhibit or you might go in to see one specific thing and only spend a few minutes there. But it's hard to do that in a museum that shares the brutal realities of the Holocaust. In fact, it's important not to just go in and out, but to experience everything. To see the loss of life and to hear recorded stories of people who survived, it was powerful, it was meaningful. It wasn't pleasant to walk through those things, but it was important. The reason it was important is because everyone who walked through there, and there were a wide variety of people from a wide variety of backgrounds, as we walked through, we all intuitively know that these kinds of actions were wrong, 
that it mattered when those things took place, when people's lives were taken so dramatically, were ruined so drastically. That seems to matter. If I live in a world without judgment, I'm wanting to live in a world where none of those actions matter. But judgment means that sin matters. And, and if sin matters, then that means our lives are significant. It's interesting to see what Burton Rus Bertrand Russell, an atheist philosopher, used to say. I do not myself feel that any person who is really profoundly humane can believe in everlasting punishment. In fact, the Pew Research Center a few years ago surveyed various generations, and 92% of those surveyed who were born between 1928 and 1964 believed about God that not only God existed, but that as a consequence, hell would exist. But only 80% of those born between 90 and 96 believed in God. But only 55 to 59% of every generation believed in hell. More believe in heaven than believe in hell. And that's one reason why the term gets used in a profane way, making light of something that people struggle to imagine. But we need a God for whom sin matters. Would you want to worship a God for whom murder didn't matter? For whom rape wasn't a matter of judgment? Is that a God we would want to worship? It's interesting to see what Paul would write to the church in Corinth about the foolishness of God being wiser than men's wisdom. If God was no wiser than me, then he would not be a God worth serving. God knows all. And judgment is important for us to establish the fact that sin matters. Judgment also means that salvation matters. The reality of judgment gives us urgency, and understanding it helps to see how important it is for us to take action. The reality of judgment gives me also appreciation. Yes, we need to understand that judgment requires a price to be paid, but I can't understand the full extent of the love of God until I understand the depth of the price that was paid for me. The more I understand sin, and its drastic and difficult effects, the more I appreciate salvation. In fact, if I don't think that sin will lead to eternal punishment, I will never appreciate the depths of what God has done. Salvation is described in several ways in Scripture, and one of the aspects to remember is that God has not only told us that a price needs to be paid, but he's provided a way for that price to be paid. Now, it wasn't uncommon for people in the ancient world to think about a god or gods wanting something from them to pay a price. What sets the God of Scripture, the true God, apart is that he is willing to pay that price. In the last few years, one of the most popular TV shows of all time has been Downton Abbey. And one of the things you notice about that show is its incredible attention to historical detail. The customs, the manners, the architecture of the time is the result of careful scholarly research. One of the things you notice, though, is that when a family is gathered for a meal, you never see that meal begin with a prayer, although that would have been custom for aristocratic families at the time. And in an interview with the show's historical consultant, he said they ordered producers to leave religion out of it for fear of alienating the public. I'm not saying that, that to denigrate the show. I like watching it. But I say that to illustrate how important it is for people who are producing things, how fearful they are of a public who'd rather just rel leave religion out of it. And yet, Scripture tells us there's really nothing we can leave religion out of. Our faith impacts every part of our lives. And even an understanding of judgment helps us understand our faith better and grow in the love for God. Ultimately, the thing I want to take away if I'm looking at God's judgment is that it means that our actions matter, means that sin matters, means that salvation matters, but we serve a God who's told us that we matter. We matter to him. And so we want to live in a way that glorifies the God who created us. My grandfather was a storyteller. And we always enjoyed sitting around and hearing him tell stories, even if we'd heard them before. And as he was telling a story, sometimes he would say the word, listen. He would say, well, now listen to this. 
Or, now let me tell you about something that happened. And you knew just by his tone of voice that he was getting started on a story. But there were other times that he might use that same word, listen. But it wasn't just to tell a story. It was to tell my sister and me to listen to him. There were times when uh, they might be taking care of us or babysitting us. And he'd say, listen. And you could always tell the difference between him saying, listen, as he's about to tell the story and listen to what I'm saying because we needed to obey. When we get to Mark chapter 4, as we've been thinking about what Jesus is teaching about discipleship, we see this word for hearing show up. It shows up at the beginning of the parable about listen to what I'm saying. And then at the end of the parable, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And it's interesting that Jesus could compare his mission to Isaiah's when he's talking about parables. Because think about the time that the prophet Isaiah would call time and time again people to hear the word of the Lord. In Isaiah 1 and verse 10, <clears throat> hear the word of the Lord. Isaiah 32 verse 9, rise up and hear, <clears throat> hear my voice, give ear to my word. Isaiah 55 verse 3, incline your ear and come to me, listen that you may live. But this of course is about more than listening. The parables aren't just about listening. They typically call for a listener to do something. They're not just fables or stories. They have an edge to them. They call on you to think carefully and act. This would push some people away and draw others closer to God. This parable is a specific one that is almost the key to understanding all parables. Starting in verse 2. And he was teaching them many things in parables and was saying to them in his teaching, listen to this. Behold, the sower went out to sow. As he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and it immediately sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Other seeds fell into the good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. And he was saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. What can we learn from this story, this parable, which isn't just a fable, but there's an edge to it, an application? Well, first we can focus on cultivating and not ignoring the soil of our heart. Jesus describes four specific types of soil here in this parable. First is the path, soil that obviously would be closely packed and a place where it would be hard for the seed to find root. Luke's account lets us know that the path here in this parable represents the heart. We can imagine birds coming straight to seeds on the path. You know, we have a bird feeder in our backyard and it's amazing to see how quickly birds can find it. Satan comes and takes away the word. Judaism often used the imagery of birds to describe demonic forces. And so it's clear there's a spiritual battle here. Ephesians 6 reminds us that our struggle isn't against flesh and blood, but the rulers, powers, and the world forces of darkness, and the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. We know what seed on the path looks like, don't we? About a message given to someone whose heart is so hard that seed can't find root. But we also have rocky ground in this parable. Parts of Galilee are known to have a layer of limestone and shale a few inches beneath the surface that could keep soil from the seed from penetrating deeply into the soil. It might be kind of like the shallow soil described here. Now Galilee was affected by heat and drought, and so the root of the plant was of vital importance. That root system had to be strong for it to survive the times it would go without moisture. It isn't bad for there to be an immediate response of faith for the seed to immediately take root and all of a sudden there's growth, but in order for it to last, there has to be depth. We've seen rocky soil, haven't we? People who are immediately excited, but eventually that excitement starts to fade. Then there's thorny ground here. This is the kind of soil where the worries and cares of the world rise up and choke the life out of the person whose faith is growing. By the way, the soil is good in a sense. It's life-giving, the only problem is there are plants already growing in it, thorns. It's easy to see how the road is bad. The seed never had a chance. 
We can even see rocky soil dangers that when things heat up, it's hard to stay faithful. But the thorns, those are tough. They're not always bad. After all, we eventually have to be concerned with some things in the world. Worries of the world, deceitfulness of riches, desire for other things, these can be intoxicating, even paralyzing. Have you ever watched someone get overtaken by thorns? Isn't it hard to know what to do, what to say? And then you have good soil. This is the kind of soil with enough depth to allow a plant to take root. The kind of growth described here is meant to illustrate some serious growth. Galilee did have fruitful soil. Although the kinds of growth described in this parable is significant, it wouldn't be completely unknown to crops in Galilee. Imagery is specifically focuses on God's favor when it describes a growth like this. We see something like this in Genesis 26, in verse 12, when Isaac sows, and he reaps in the same year a hundredfold because the Lord had blessed him. Haven't you seen people who are growing and on fire? So what we have to do is say, what kind of soil am I cultivating? The soil, not the seed, determines what happens next. Jesus is clear that the seed being sown is the word of God. Paul described it this way in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. Am I willing to trust in the word of God? You know, we sometimes feel the pressure to soften up the edges or make it more presentable, but it's not necessary. This is not a human invention. It's the soil, not the seed, that determines its growth. But we can also start to focus on sowing, not judging the hearts of others. I can cultivate and not ignore my own heart, but also to sow and not judge the hearts of other people. This sower is using the broadcasting technique of sowing where handfuls of seeds are carefully thrown into the air. And the intent, of course, is to put it on ground that's already cultivated, but the seeds could land anywhere. We typically f picture the kinds of farmland we see now when we're driving down uh, the road with long, neat rows, but farms in ancient Galilee were much closer together and the land was uneven. Jesus spread his message on every kind of soil. He'd preach a message to the Pharisees and religious leaders who had already determined they didn't believe in him. Jesus would perform miracles and they would claim that he was doing them through the power of Satan, but he continues to sow. There are crowds that gather around Jesus for miracles. And there are times when Jesus will follow a miracle with tough teaching. And as John 6 shows us, people who had been so excited to get the benefit of the miracles, like the feeding of the 5,000, would quickly leave. The sun came out. Teaching got hard. Yet Jesus continued to sow. There was a rich man who came to Jesus once, determined that he'd already been living faithfully. But as Jesus sowed the word of God, he told this man that his possessions were standing in his way. When he was challenged to sell everything that he had and follow Jesus, he walked away sad because he had many possessions. The worries of this life had choked out that potential, but Jesus still sowed. Of course, there were others like the apostles who followed him. They weren't perfect, but his teaching took root in their hearts. He still sowed. We're called to spread our message to every single kind of soil. I can't make assumptions about who deserves or doesn't deserve the message based on my own preconceived notions. I need to continue to sow. That's why we want to spread the message of Jesus in other countries, but also in our own neighborhoods, every kind of soil. I need to cultivate and not ignore the soil of my heart, but I need to sow, not judge the hearts of others. That's what we're trying to do. Ultimately, that's our mission. That's what we're seeking to do at the Graymere Church of Christ. We may not always do it perfectly, but we're always seeking to share that perfect seed, that word of God. We'd love to have you come and worship with us. On Sunday morning, our worship begins at 9, and that's followed by Bible classes for all ages. On 6 o'clock, we have a worship service here, along with Bible classes for children on Sundays. And then Wednesdays at 6.30, we have Bible class time together. We'd love to study the Word of God with you at any of those times. It may be that you want to study with us about becoming a Christian. We'd love to talk with you about that. We're here to just sow the seed. It's not in our own power. It's not in the power of any human being, but the power of the God who gave us his word. And we'd love to share that word with you. We hope you'll connect with us. Find us online at graymere.com. You will always receive a warm welcome from the Graymere Church of Christ.